by ClubWWI.com members. The gentleman I'm standing by with this week uh, has been a part of many big moments in wrestling history from well, the first Royal Rumble to the first Survivor Series. In fact, he was a part of many memories that many fans out there have of not only WWF, but also WCW. And guys, well, he happens to be one half of the Young Stallions. I am, of course, talking about the one and only Mr. Jim Powers. Jim, how are you? Well, James, thank you for that big introduction. I greatly do appreciate it. I don't think I've ever been been put over that strongly by anybody. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You can consider me uh, your, your personal Dale Wolf today. <laughs> put you right over. Jim, before we even get started, uh, what I do with all of our guests, we give you a chance to, to tell the fans what's going on by you. How's uh, life in the world of Jim Powers? Well, right now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to rededicate myself to the uh, independent circuit. I'm trying to find the right promoters on the independent circuit that um, are just not fly-by-nighters, guys, that um, don't think about one show at a time, two shows at a time. Maybe they think for the future, like, what can we do six months, nine months, a year down the road? You know, can we do this right? Can we pay the boys accordingly? Can we uh, put a storyline together? Things like that. And, and you know, unfortunately, I'm, I'm finding that they're few and far in between. And there's a couple that I'm working with right now, and I hope they, I hope, geez, I really do hope that they get it. Uh -huh. you know, this way, as opposed to going, well, we've got you booked on such and such a show here, here and there and there and there. But after that, we don't know. Yeah. So I'm looking for the after that, and we don't know that we can put together. And that, you know, as I remember years ago, the independent circuit, especially on the northern east coast, was a tremendous uh a tremendous way for guys to make to make a few extra dollars while they're in transition from w, uh, WWF. For me, it was now WWE, to WCW, or the TNA now, whatever it is, or until they get themselves involved, maybe with Japan. But the independent circuit, from what I see, is not what it used to be, and I'm hoping that I can hook up with someone that has the same visions that I do. You know what, it's funny too because it's, there used to be a time, I know exactly what you're saying, I think anyone who, who remembers even territories was, you know, things kind of flowed from week to week. Now it seems like a lot of spot shows you show and it's an exhibition and then next, next week they could have completely different people there and, uh, you know, kind of meaningless from show to show is just to, to get a crowd in for that one event and there's no long-term plans. Well, exactly. I mean, it's, uh, I've done, I've done a few independent shows in the last couple of years and, uh, I've done some appearances and conventions and things like that, and there never seems to be a follow-up. And I don't know if that's because, you know, as I've said, I, I've said in other interviews, the boys screw it up for the boys, uh -huh. which we've been known to do, or um, the promoter was just that much of a damn mark that he was just happy to have certain names around him, circulating around him for that evening. I, I don't know what it is, but I know it can be done if it's done properly, and it doesn't take that much. I mean, I ran a couple of independent shows years ago, back in 95 and 96, and as we ran three independent shows, I had a partner, and as time went on, I mean, it's only three shows, but we learned how to run them, how to make money at them, and how to make everybody in the audience happy, as well as the boys being happy. So if I can find a couple of those guys that are out there, um, boy, I'd like to hitch my wagon to them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things that I, I mean that, that I was reading about you uh, that I always found most interesting, and you were actually started off uh, apparently by Big John Studd. Is that right? Back in the uh, when you first started in the business. Well, the thing with John Studd is uh, it's not so much that John Studd had any hand in training me. Okay. Um, there was an individual who I'm not going to give any credit to right now because right. I wasn't happy with the way things turned out. But he was a he was a preliminary middle of the road guy at best. I don't even think it was middle of the road. He worked for Vince's father, and he was from the local area here. I live in northern New Jersey. He was from the local area, and I was doing security in nightclubs. And he approached me, and I was always intrigued by professional wrestling as a young man. And he approached me and said, "Hey Jim, I'm running a wrestling school, and uh, would you like to be involved?" Well. Shoot, you know, great. That's you know, fantastic. Because as a young man, as a young as a young kid, and, and, and uh, up until I got to my teens, I was always intrigued by professional wrestling. And as time went on, I got intrigued by the thoughts and and uh, the thoughts and what was going on with with teenage girls. So I went from went from 
professor of wrestling with teenage girls, <laughs> yeah. and then here this here this uh, guy approached me, and he was running around since school. I said, hey, why not? At the time, I had just sold a gym that I had, and I was kind of like in transition and working nightclubs and doing bouncing security work. And I said, sure, I'll give a shot at it. Um, so he, he trained me partially. He got me started in the ring. Got in the ring, and we got me. He got me started a little bit. But unfortunately, what happened there is I couldn't fulfill my end of an obligation financially. And he just said to me, "Well, Jim, it was one particular night where we went down to the ring, and he just said, "Well, Jim, he says tonight you're supposed to pay me X amount of dollars, and you don't have it. So I'm sorry, but I can't put. You, I can't let you get in the ring tonight, and I can't train you anymore." Well, you know what that did? That did nothing but fuel my fire. Uh -huh. so I sat out there like a puppy dog with his tail between his legs, and I sat out there, and I watched everybody else get in the ring and work out and do whatever they're going to do. And what it, what inevitably ha ended up happening was I started getting booked by independent promoters, and it was kind of like on-the-job training. Uh -huh. And one of the first guys I met, God rest his soul, was Ted Petty. And he kind of helped me out considerably because we used to go to Eastern Pennsylvania and wrestle every three or four weeks, whatever it was. But um, it was on the job training. And as far as the John Stone thing goes, I was in a gym um, here in, in, in northern New Jersey, and my, which my friend owned. And he was a friend of John Studd's. John Studd was, John Studd, excuse me, was in the area. And um, I was introduced to John Studd through the owner of the gym, and John Studd said, well, I understand you're doing independent shows and wrestling and all this stuff, and he said, if you'd like, you can take the ride with me tomorrow, you can come up to Poughkeepsie, New York, and I'll introduce you to George Scott, who's the current booker for WWF, now WWE, and uh, see if they want to put you on TV. Well, I said, sure. I mean, I jumped at the opportunity. I went up there, and they saw that, you know, I was a big guy, decent-looking guy, whatever, you know, whatever they saw in me. They saw a body and they saw a look, and they threw me out there. And I think one of my first matches was Nikolai Volkov, which uh, <laughs> uh, I ended up maybe getting myself my ass kicked about uh, two or three times that that particular day. But I didn't care, you know, because I was a part of something that I enjoyed, that I had a, a, a passion for, that I didn't I didn't realize had crept under my skin and gotten into my blood as much as it had, and. I got a big, wonderful, whopping payday of fifty dollars to get my ass kicked at least twice. I was just happy. Money was always, to me, money was always a byproduct of what I had a passion for doing. Mm -hmm. I think that's the cool thing is that uh, we're talking to so many people who who have a passion for the business, and this comes up so often in interviews where I say to guests, for somebody who really loves professional wrestling, it means more when you're in it than somebody who just kind of, you know, fell back on it. Like somebody who really loves the business and then does it. When you're achieving these things and you're in WWF, to somebody like you, it's it's a big deal. But to somebody who might not otherwise, you know, recognize it, actually adds a new layer uh, to your, to your enjoyment of, of actually being in the business when when you love the business. Well, the thing the thing with me, I mean, there are there are there are people that call themselves the boys. One of the boys, I'm one of the boys, I'm one of the boys. Well, you know, being one of the boys is someone who has got wrestling in their blood. It's creeped into their creeped into their skin. It's gotten into their blood, and it's a part of them. And a lot of those, one of the boys, individuals, unfortunately, have passed away. And you know, I oftentimes ask myself, why Kurt Henning, who I admired, and idolized, and um, thought he was the you know fantastic as a wrestler, as a performer, or whatever, Rick Rude. And, and, and a few others, these guys had made millions of dollars in the wrestling business, and why were they found dead? I don't know I don't know so much about Rick. I'm speaking about Kurt more specifically. Why was a guy like that, who was worth millions of dollars, who had made millions of dollars in the wrestling business, had a family, I think he had three or four uh, 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 children, why are they found dead in a hotel room in Tampa, Florida, because of drugs? didn't need the money. It was something that, in my opinion, crept under his skin, got into his blood, and just didn't know. And a lot of us don't, and I'm at that point right now, don't know how to transition to punching that clock and doing that 9-to-5 or that 8-to-4 deal. Yeah. It's just, uh, 
you know, and Rick Rude, I mean, uh, from what I heard, and this is, this, is, this is hearsay, and I've heard it so many times, that hearsay takes on some merit if you hear it from a few different individuals, especially individuals that you respect, that you know, that Rick Rude was found with um, burn marks on his fingernails because he was supposedly smoking crack cocaine from a can and his fingernails, I'm sorry, not his fingernails, his fingertips were burned from holding an hot can. So, I mean, you go, what what happened there? You kind of wonder. And as time goes on, I go, well, maybe they just had a difficult time transitioning to what the real world was going to be for them. And um, it's, a, it's a sad, sad thing. Um, and it's nice to see in this day and age that um, not as many wrestlers are passing away as used to be. So the era that I was involved in, as good as it was, it took its toll on a lot more people than any other era. Mm-hmm. Well, it's actually funny that you bring that up because that was a, a subject that, and I know you're going to think it's a transition, but it actually is it's just, you know, from hearing what you're saying, Paul Roma had spoken about um, that time period. And one of the subjects talked about Louis Spicoli and feeling that maybe there was some details around his death that he thought, personally, was maybe the boys playing a rib and putting something in his drink. And he had mentioned a, a night that they thought they had killed out back Jack. And it kind of seemed like the party atmosphere, not only people doing things to themselves, but doing things to others and thinking that, you know, everybody's invincible in that time period. And it kind of carried over through the years. Well, I, don't, I don't think it's just in professional wrestling where we think we're invincible. I think if we look back on all of our, a lot of our lives, and when we're younger, we're full of piss and vinegar, and we can run through brick walls, and we will never die. But as you get older, it's different. And as far as the ribs go, I would hate to think that anybody, I, I knew Louis Spicoli. Um, I would hate to think that anybody pulled that kind of a rib that cost this kid his life. And he was a kid, you know, he was a kid from California trying to fit in. And maybe he was trying to fit in in a way that, as far as, I mean, as far as his wrestling goes, um, his wrestling ability was was okay at best, and his appearance was okay at best, and uh, maybe he was trying to fit in with the pills and the alcohol and the socialization with the boys, and I don't know. I wasn't there. I can only speculate, but... Um, um, I, I don't know that Louie had any enemies, but if somebody yeah. pulled a rib like that, well, there's a place for them in hell. Yeah. Well, but, but you, you bring up an interesting point when you say that it, it wasn't just wrestling, because even that whole time period, it kind of, you know, you look at Saturday Night Live, you look at all the, the different genres of entertainment back then that are kind of, you know, cleaner now. Uh, back then, it, it seemed like a lot of people were experimenting. Um, that's an understatement. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is an understatement. Experimenting? We weren't experimenting. We, we knew what we were getting ourselves into. We knew what we were going to do. Every night was New Year's Eve. Yep. The only night we had off was New Year's Eve. I mean, you know, but um, it was it was a, you know it was a rock star type lifestyle. And I'm sure you know people who are listening. I've seen the MTV and the VH1. Uh, where are they now? Rock stars and this and that and that. Well, shit. I mean, you know, professional wrestlers weren't that far off. You know what? What you know? We were pseudo celebrities, or maybe we were celebrities. Um, in, in certain people's minds, but it's 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 the it's the doors that get opened up for you. It's the perks that are given to you. I mean, you don't even ask for them, and stuff is just thrown at you. Um, and, and you can take that however you, way you want. You know, there's a lot of things that are thrown at you, and it's not like you have to try to uh, have a good time or um, um, look for a particular. Uh, well, I hate to use it, I mean, you know. Drugs, women, this, that, that it was all—it was all there. It was all laid out on a silver platter, mm-hmm. you know. Um, whether whether people, m- most of the boys, and I and I always say the boys because there were some individuals that got involved in wrestling strictly because it was business the way of making money. But most of the boys partook, you know, and that had to be at least ninety percent of us. Because yeah. you know, it's like going—it's like going into a uh, you know a big Walmart saying. Hey, shop for free for the next hour or so. It's that kind of deal. Yeah, yeah. So, who would take advantage of that? You know, we were kids. We were kids in a candy store, and, and a lot of us now, even to this day, I've, I've, I've interacted with, with with guys who I worked with years ago, who are my age, if not older, or somewhere on around my age, and we're like big, big 
kids. You know, we're like big, you know, big children. It's very difficult to, to grow up. It's very difficult to let that go. I think I've done a pretty good job, you know, based on based on what I saw at the convention I did a couple weeks ago, uh, realizing that I don't fit in there anymore mm -hmm. as far as that goes. I'm not a child. I'm not a big kid like that, you know, but there's other individuals that can't let that WWF slash WWE, WCW, notoriety, notoriety and fame, let, they can't let go of it. So we act out like we used to. When we get the opportunity, we act out like we used to when we're put in that environment. But what happens there is a promoter who's running a convention or a show, you know, he gets turned off by it, especially if you've got police cars, you've got families complaining, you've got people busting up uh, uh, functions, you know, slash Iron Sheik. Yeah, you know, I'm going to ask you about that. Yeah. I, I mean, saw you right there, right front and center at the uh, at the vet. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, I, I, I just found it was, a, it was a rude awakening. It was a slap, not a rude awakening. It was a slap in the face to me. And I realized, because as time went on, my career in the wrestling business, I traveled alone. I had my own room. And at the end of the evening, if I wanted to go someplace and keep a low profile, profile and decompress, I went by myself, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that that was the uh, that was a realization. I one of the realizations I had by going to this convention a couple weeks ago. Well, it's actually when you when you brought up the roast, I thought that was one of the things I definitely wanted to ask you about because one of the things I noticed, and if anybody saw the videos online, it was when. When Scott Hall came up, he had, he had the issue with the comedian, and, and he was getting angry, and there was going to be an altercation. And one of the things I noticed, there you were, uh, you came up calmly, and you kind of diffused the situation. Everybody else, I mean, it, people tend to get a little worked up, and this one's yelling, that one's yelling. And, and it struck me that you were being, uh, you know, you were calmly trying to get him out. I mean, how was that situation like for you? And, uh, I mean, is that something you've done before in the past? Have you had to be kind of the, uh, you know, the, the voice of reason to step in between? No, I've never really had to be a voice of reason. I'm sure there were times where I was not the voice of reason, <laughs> and my wife will attest to that. But, um, or and, you know, but at that particular at that particular incident, that, 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 that excuse me, that particular incident there, um, Scott and I had spent about an hour, an hour and a half together in my room, uh, with, you know, with my wife, and we were just conversing and you know, reminiscing and reflecting and all that stuff, and. Uh, um, when we finally got Scott, the, the Scott Hall that entered my room mm -hmm. is not the Scott Hall that left my room. Okay. Um, so I felt a little bit of an obligation there. And as much as I love Scott, I love Scott. Uh, I consider him a, a, a friend. Um, I just felt an obligation there to kind of make sure that he didn't get it himself into any more trouble, whether it be um, arrested, mm -hmm. um whether it be caused a promoter to not be able to run the event the following day, which would have cost a lot of people a lot of money, more so the promoter than anybody else. And he thanked me for it later on that evening and the following day. I just felt an obligation to kind of like, I hate to use the word babysit, but look out for Scott that evening. Yeah. And that's what that was. Had I not spent any time with Scott, um, immediately... I spent an hour and a half at least, and it seemed like an eternity in my hotel room with him. Um, and we just happened to come off the elevator and walk in that side door, and that comment was made. And I said, oh, man. So had I not spent time with Scott prior to that, I don't think I would have been as involved to try to um, calm the situation down at all. Yeah. Um, I would have I would have been a spectator like there were many others and I'm not going to name their names who I thought were closer to Scott or as close to Scott as I am who just sat there and watched the show or watched it unravel or yeah. or, or just just turned to excuse me shit yeah you know I mean Scott 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 had a good point Scott made a statement uh -huh. um, but he didn't know where to put the period at the end of the sentence. But I heard that. I heard, and Owen and I, Owen and I were very close. I was, I went to Owen's funeral, very close to the Hart family, and I believe not only did Scott Hall, not only did Scott Hall's toes curl and his fists clench, but everybody else's did in the room that knew any better. Yeah, knew Owen Hart. 
But Scott acted on it, and that's fine. That's okay. He grabbed the guy, put him up against the wall, did what he did, grabbed the microphone, said what he had to say, made a statement, made his point, but there was never a period put at the end of that sentence. Okay. And what happened was as Scott was walking off the, the stage, the people started with Scott, razor, 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 which is like throwing a dry log on a fire. Yeah. And that's what just kept him going. Yeah. And so um, I, I don't I don't know. I've, I've never been in rehab. I don't know anything about any of that stuff. Um, I know he's had problems with alcohol, and I know he's had problems with drugs and whatever, but... Um, it's a shame because the Scott Hall I know and love is not the Scott Hall that walked into that room, and he does have a big heart, and he's a, he was a, he is a tremendous talent, was a tremendous talent, and I I I'm not a psychologist. I hadn't seen Scott in many many years, so I don't know what's going on in his life. I don't know what. I wish him nothing but the best. Well, I think one of the things that actually made you uh, such an asset for him, and if, and if he's hearing this, I hope he appreciates it. It's in 2008, with with YouTube and with the videos. I mean, when I was a kid, I had gone to an autograph signing, and I had seen a, uh, a performer who was really in no shape to be signing autographs, and ended up you know, puking on himself. And it's the kind of story that I was kept with me. But nowadays, it's like whenever something like that might happen, there's a million people with camera phones or whatever, and it was it's almost assured it's going to end up on the internet. So in a way, you kind of prevented that. And it must be tough, too, that, you know, you kind of, I think a lot of guys have to kind of watch what they do because so many uh, so many fans have access to, to seeing you 24-7. Well, what's happened, I think, is, is um, wrestlers as well as other entertainer, entertainers as well as sports figures mm -hmm. don't realize, because years ago, we were, um, let's see, we were, for the most part, untouchable. I mean, you could be driving down a road. I mean, I remember this many a time, and I remember certain situations that I'm not going to be specific about right now. We're getting pulled over by a cop, and the car may be full of things it shouldn't be full of, and people in the car that shouldn't be in the car, and the cop's going, oh, you're so-and-so, and you're so-and-so, and so-and-so. -and -so. Have a good night. They never should have let us go. So wrestlers, entertainers, rock stars, uh, in the past, have always gotten away with whatever they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. They had carte blanche. But now, from what I see, I don't watch a lot of the entertainment shows. And, but I mean, you know, I see the computer and, and, and the, the newspapers and stuff. You're under the microscope. Yep. And if, if, if there's anyone they want to get, they want to get a entertainer. They want to get an athlete. They want to get someone who's high profile. You no longer, you no longer have carte blanche that you can do whatever you want and just walk away from it. And they go, "Wow, I just pulled over a so and so, and he's a tremendous entertainer. Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. No, I just pulled over Nick Nolte, and we've got his mugshot. I'm just using that as an example. No, no, I know you're talking about. I'm mean. just using that as an example. We just pulled over a so and so, and he's going to be all over the news with this, you know, looking like a damn fool yeah. with this mugshot. When in fact the guy was actually doing some, from what I understand, because um, my wife tells me she reads all the glam, uh, the people in Us magazines, that he was actually getting himself like that for a part in a movie, and I don't know the movie, I just, but I'm saying, wrestlers, entertainers, athletes, um, uh, figure, people, that, people that are high profile are no longer exempt from um, DWIs, um, drug possession, oh, yeah. so, you go on and on and on and on with all the things that we were let go with in the past. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I could get very graphic about it, but I'm not going to. I mean, we, 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 we ran roughshod, but now society's changed. Yeah. And those people are under the microscope, and those people are the ones that are going to end up on Inside Edition, <laughs> Entertainment Tonight, and... If it's that bad, they're going to end up on the nightly news. Yeah. So it's it's things have changed. Do you, do you still watch the night? Do you still watch WWE or TNA? I, what I do is I what I like to try and do, if I remember, is I will I will tape Raw because I believe that to be their premier show or their number one show, and somewhere during the course of the week, I'll try to skim through it like I did tonight. I watched 
I don't know, I watched one match with Rey Mysterio and some guy who was six foot seven, who of course Rey beat one, two, three in the middle of the ring, but um, I'll skim through it and look and see what the product is out there. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I don't make a conscious effort to do it, but um, every once in a while I, I, I will. I mean, do you like, I mean, that's one of the things, too, that it, it's changed so much, and we talked to uh, some people who, you know, work for WWE, don't watch it anymore. I mean, do you, do you enjoy the product or anything that, you know, how do you feel it compares to when, uh, when, you, when you were with the company, the changes? You know what? Um, I have two schools of thoughts on this. I mean, Vince McMahon and his company are putting asses in the seats. You know, people are showing up. They're selling out arenas. They're selling... Merchandise, they can't keep enough merchandise on the shelves or on the internet or whatever. However way they're selling their merchandise and whatever they're doing, they're making money. It's a billion-dollar operation. He's a billionaire. Um, he's, I, I, I think he's on the stock, stock market. I don't uh-huh. follow yeah. that. But I think he's, he's on the stock market and all that stuff. But um, the, for me, it's very difficult to sit there on a Monday night and watch a show where one person goes to the ring, they open up the show, one person goes to the ring with a microphone. Well, 15 minutes later, you've got three people in the ring with microphones. <laughs> yep. And they're going back and forth and going, we didn't have that back then. You know how you had to get those people? That's my, that's, that's what I call cheap heat. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, like, like Mick Foley used to do, Mick Foley used to do it as a joke. It's great to be here in. Yep. And you look around like, where am I? Chicago, Illinois. I mean, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And the place would pop, but Mick knew what he was doing. And that's kind of like what they're doing right now. You're, they're using the microphone to get cheap heat. Yeah. Whereas years ago, we had to go to the ring. Two wrestlers. Let's say, I don't know, whomever. You know, and go out there. No microphones, no banter, no promos, no this, no that. And just go out there and you'd have to get those people up off their seats because of your wrestling. You had to create a story. You had to establish a heel. You had to establish a baby face. Sometimes you didn't know if Jake the Snake was a baby face or a heel. Yep. You know, I mean, uh, it, it's just, it's, it was that kind of thing. And I miss that psychology of wrestling. I thought, and I've done interviews and I've spoken to people, there was a time maybe a couple months ago I was watching the program where I got the impression that they were getting back to that. Like, okay, grab a head. Grab the headlock, yep. and we'll do a series of moves. We'll come back. We'll do what we call high spot. We'll get back to the headlock and over, and we'll go from there, which is some of the, a lot of the matches I had with Ric Flair, you know, um, and or grab an arm, work an arm bar, work something, and it's not – like that, if they're sell- what they're doing is they're selling action and entertainment as opposed to wrestling. Yeah, and it's become more of an entertainment thing. And I can't say they're doing anything wrong. You know, I'm not a mar- I'm not a marketing genius like Vince McMahon. Apparently, he is, and he's branched out to other things with uh, movies and stuff like that. So kudos to him for doing what he's doing. Um, do I like it? Do I care to watch the product? Will I put myself in front of it for three hours? No, no, I'll tape it if I remember, and I'll skip through it to see just what's out there, and hopefully I'll get a good match. The matches I like to watch are the ones with Shawn Michaels, Hunter, because I know these guys are going to work old school, uh-huh. you know, especially Shawn. Shawn's old school, so whoever he's working with, they're going to grab an arm, they're going to grab a leg, they're going to grab a head, they're going to work a body part, they're going to go into a series of moves, which we call high spots, and then they're going to end up back on that head, or it's rear chin lock, you know, it's something as simple as that. And then you just sit there, and you got to get those people. you got to suck those people in with what you're doing in the ring, not with a microphone. Yeah. You well, know? You, I was going to say, one of, the, one of the examples of that, and this is something that I always remember, that the first Royal Rumble, uh, you, you and Roma had a match against uh, the Islanders that I think to this day I actually saw it recently. And, I mean, it still stands up to this day. Yeah, that, 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 was, the, that was before the Royal Rumble was a pay-per-view. So. Yeah, it was in USA. That's an indication of what I got paid. But anyway, it's a light art. But we, we, we did a match. It was a two, I think it may have Two been out of three, right? Yeah. A two out of three, four. It was done in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I believe it was Hamilton or Kitchener. I, 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 just, know, I just know the hotel was right across the street from the arena, which 
which made travel very easy. Um, but we did we did a match, and it was the first Royal Rumble. It was us against the Islanders, and they did something. We did an angle there where we did we did something where Paul hurt his leg, mm -hmm. and that was on a Sunday. The next day, we were in Madison Square Garden, and uh, Paul was obviously had a still work, you know, the injured leg, knee, ankle, whatever it was, and. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know the outcome. I'm sure they probably beat us. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's right. I don't think anybody can beat Haku. Haku. Haku could be in a room by himself real quick if he wanted to. <laughs> um, well, I mean, is it, one of the things, and obviously I was going to ask you about this, but, I mean, working, so many people have the memory of you and Paul as, as the young stallions. And we just had Paul on uh, a little while ago. And it was kind of, it's one of those interviews that people still kind of bring up because they kind of seem like, um, like, I mean, he had something to say about everybody. Uh, and one of the things he was talking about was, was teaming up with you. And it, the irony is that although he was a bit harsh in some some places compared to some of the other people, he kind of you, you kind of one of the ones he was nicest about, I guess. Um, but mentioned that one of the issues that you guys had, he said that you know as the young stallions, as the notoriety grew, um, you know the, the, the ego grew, so to speak. Right. Uh, I just want to get your response from that way on, on how you saw that. I know that you and Paul have appeared together, and things like that. So it doesn't seem like there's animosity. But how do you feel about it? I, I really don't. Um you know, I, 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 I never, you know, I would have, I would have liked to have spent more time with Paul. I saw him a couple weekends ago and, and addressed that. But as far as my ego goes, if anyone really knows me, they know I don't have an ego. Um, if I had an ego, I probably wouldn't have lasted as long as I did with the World Wrestling Federation or WWE as it is now mm -hmm. because I would have checked my ego. I, you know, I, I learned years ago, check your ego at the door. And um, just do business. This is your job. This is your position. This is what's available to you right now. And you either want it or you don't. And I don't. I, I never had that. And maybe I was wrong to a certain degree to that to not put. I was. I'll be honest and say that I wasn't the greatest of businessmen when it came to wrestling. And maybe Paul was a little better and a little bit more pushy. But I was just happy to be there. And I'll say this countless times, and I've said this countless times, that I was just happy to be a part of something and to be doing something that money was just a byproduct. You know, um, as far as my ego, I don't have an ego. I don't have a big ego. Um, I never wanted to be, um, I, wanted, I never wanted anyone to consider me glory. I never wanted anyone to consider me a part of the wonderful team, or I, I don't know what they were called. Um, but from a business perspective, maybe I should have pushed a little harder, but it could have been that my insecurities um, kept me from doing that. Um, I had some personal interaction with the higher-ups from WWF at the time that led me to believe that if I didn't want to do what they asked of me, that, hey, there's a hundred other guys that would love to be jobbers, enhancement talent, um, middle-of-the-road guys. They're there. So I, I, I kind of I, I got a grip on that and realized that it is what it is for me. Um, this is the position that's offered to me, and if I want it, that's fine. This is my job. This is where I'm going to be. And if I want it, I can stay here. If I don't want it, well, there's the door. And I came to that realization. I mean, don't get me wrong. Don't think I just laid back and was a total pussy. I came to the realization that I, I was just, you know, they had split me and Paul up, and we went on separate ways. And I don't even know if Paul was still with Vince or not. I'm not sure. But I remember just watching one, two, three kid when they first brought him in. You know, he had a match on Raw, one of the first Raws at the Manhattan Center in New York. And they gave one, two, three kid a win right in the middle of the ring on Razor Ramon, the Intercontinental Champion. And I went to Vince McMahon next time we got together at the TV tapings and I approached Vince McMahon because that was kind of like the straw that broke my, broke the camel's back or broke my back. And I went to Vince McMahon and the, the mind screwer that he is, I'm mean, use nice terminology here. Um, I went to Vince McMahon and said, Vince, you know, I've been watching this. I watch Raw, and you brought this new kid in, one, two, three kid, and 
you gave him a win on the Intercontinental Champion, right in the middle of the ring. One, two, three. He pinned the Intercontinental Champion, Razor Ramon. I said, you know, Vince, I've, I've been loyal to you for all these years. Now, I don't remember that. It had to be around the 90s or somewhere around there. I mean, I've been 93 or 94, right around 93, I think. Well, 94, I was already gone by then. So I thought, no, 93 then, yeah. Yeah, you know, whenever, whenever, whenever the first right, Raw yeah. started. Uh -huh. And I said to Vince, I said, well, you know, I, I have been loyal to you all these years. I've had opportunities to go to WCW, which I did. Um, I, I forget who the book was. Allen's, Terry, Terry Allen, or... Was oh, Kay Allen Fry? Uh, excuse me? What was it, Allen Fry? He was there for a little while? It was someone who was a booker who got into a car accident. Magnum T. Oh, Magnum T. Yeah, Terry Allen, yeah. Anyway, I was offered, I was offered to go there. I went to WCCW for a time, and I explained all this events, and I said, you know, I could have gone here, I could have gone there, I could have done this, I could have done that, but I was always loyal to you. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sitting home, and I'm watching this Raw show, and this new kid comes walking in the door, and you put him over one, two, three on Razor Ramon, you're Intercontinental Champion. I said, Vince, you could have done that for me. And he looked me square in the eye and said, you know, Jim, you're right, I could have, period. Now, now, where do I go from there? Yeah, seriously. So what I did was I said, Vince, I says, you know, I took a couple steps back and thought about it. And I said, Vince, I said, why don't we do this? I said, it's been a while. So, you know, Jim Powers has been on TV a long time, many years with you, preliminary job or enhancement, whatever you want to call it. Um, why don't, why doesn't Jim Powers take four or six months off of TV and we could bring back Jim Powers and, Maybe recreate the character, something different, something new, something whatever. Maybe the people will have forgotten, you know, and that could come back as something new and fresh. So he looked me in the eye again. He says, sure, no problem. Well, I found myself home four months, five months, six months, no calls, no nothing. And I found myself constantly calling the office just to get my job back because I come to the realization that this was my position, this was the level I was at, and there was nothing I can do to sway Vince's mind, the company's mind, the company being Vince. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, if I want to be a part of this thing called World Wrestling Federation, now WWE, um, I have to accept this. And I did want to be a part of it. And I loved it. You know, I loved I loved being a part of this wrestling business, this thing of ours that we call the you know professional wrestling. Um, and I still do, I still do, I still you know I'll get in the locker room and I see the young guys and stuff like that, and I I still have this passion for it. But maybe you know it, it's coming to a point where you know at, at my age and as long as I've been around, maybe it's an unhealthy passion for me. I'm not sure yet. I mean, it, it sounds like, uh, you know, especially at the time, I mean, we've heard from other people, too, in that position. But one of the weird things about you and Paul as a team or just you as a singles guy was that you weren't strictly the enhancement talent. I mean, you guys, you received a push. You got a win over the Hart Foundation when they were the tag champions. You actually had the, the, the angle with the music. It always seemed like they had you both right on the cusp of being about to break out. And it kind of seemed like, like you stayed there for a lot of the time. Well, yeah. I think uh, as, as far as Paul and myself and, and why that whole thing didn't work out, and I think that's where you're going with this. Uh, well, I mean, in general, you're, you're just your career with, with WWE, even without Paul, I always kind of felt like oh, without, people, without, people knew, well, he, with Paul and without Paul, you, people knew Jim Powers, and it seemed like even when you were, were putting somebody else over, it was, it was more than just kind of like so-and-so versus, you know, uh, uh, enhancement talent. It was, you know, you, you still had a name no matter when you were there. Even as the company wasn't pushing you, you still, you had enough respect with the fans that, that you kind of, you kept right on that cusp. Well, I think, I think because, I think that's, I think the word there is perseverance. Mm -hmm. You know, I just didn't mind, Jim, you're going to go out there, you're going to get beat up by John Stutt. Jim, you're going to go out there, you're going to beat up by Ken Patera. Jim, you're going to go out there and this and that. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I hung in there, I hung in there, I hung in there, I hung in there. And you know what? Kudos to the fans if they saw that. Yeah. You know, thank you, fans, if you saw that, that I hung in there, and you knew it wasn't me, you knew the company was pulling the strings, and I thank them all for, for that, you know, and I thank, you know, uh, um, all, all the people that can respect that, 
that understood that it wasn't me. You know, I have I have so many people that come up to me and go, well, geez, Jim, I mean, you know, you're you, you you had a great body, you've got a great look, you have good ability. Why didn't they? Why didn't they? Why didn't they? Why didn't they? I don't have an answer to why didn't they. I have I have um, that's the word I'm looking for. I have uh, some reasons why I think they may not have, and that's really not the word I'm looking for. But I mean, I have, I have my, I have, I have my reasons why I think. I, you know what? I kind of, I, James, I, I kind of ran with the rebellious crowd. Uh-huh. Um, as odd as it sounds, I got along with the top guys as well as the bottom guys, and it wasn't a matter of positioning. You know, uh, Jim's a jobber, so we're not going to hang out with him. Well, shit. I hung out with Kurt Henning, Rick Rude, Hulk Hogan. I mean, I, Ultimate Warrior, and I consider him to be a very good friend. Although I haven't spoken to him in a couple of years, but if anyone knows anything about Jim, he's a very intense individual. But when you do speak to him, but you know when you do speak, what I consider a friend is somebody you don't speak to, and you pick up the phone after a couple of years, and it's like you didn't miss a beat. Yep. But anyway, I, I, I ran with the rebellious crowd, um, and I think that's what's kind of like... Um, stuck in Vince's craw. Uh-huh. Oh, and there was a time, there was a point in time there where he was going through some kind of steroid controversy and they sent me to New York to go and meet with his lawyers and um, I was supposed to testify on his behalf if it came down to it. Uh-huh. And I just disagreed with everything. I told I told the attorneys, I said, well, I, you know, this is, you know, this is a steroid thing that's running rampant and um, it's unfair, and I, you know, I, I, I actually, I, I spoke my mind. I stood up for what I felt and what I believed, and I don't think that's that's what they wanted to hear. <laughs> so the fact that I ran with the rebellious crowd is what held me back, because um, you know, business, business in general, not only wrestling, business is political. Yeah. You know, and and um, I've tried to get back in with the WWF up until a few months ago when I was led to believe that there was a training. Uh, there was there was room for a trainer in one of their facilities, and um, only to be told that well, right now, Jim, at the current time, there's nothing available for you. But that's not to say that something won't open up in the near future. Well, if I hear that one more time, uh-huh. my head will explode. You know, so I knew that. You know, I mean, there were Vince Vince McMahon is the guy. The rest of them around him are figureheads, um, but. I forgot your initial question to begin with, but I go off on a rant. Oh, no, you actually answered my initial. I think one of the one of the things I want to ask you specifically about um, one of the moments that you guys had that I I had interviewed Jim Brunzel, and oh, we had talked okay. we had talked about the Survivor Series, the first one. Um, but I guess you guys and the Bees are the final two teams, unless I'm remembering it wrong. That was right, right? It was you guys uh, and the Bees were actually the sole survivors. Yes, that's one of the things that he had said personally. He kind of felt like. It was, to him, it was almost his way of saying, because he, he kind of felt similar to, to you did about Vince McMahon, kind of, there were moments where he felt as though they, he was kind of like playing games and, you know, just kind of messing with his mind a little bit. And he said that when, when the bees didn't get to stand there alone, or even you guys, when, when you guys had to do it together, he kind of felt like that was just another example of, of Vince trying to, you know, not put him over fully. I mean, did you feel that way when you guys were, uh, were there at the end? Well, you know what? Again, getting back to him. My personal feelings. I was just happy to be a part of it. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to say like, hey, you know, Jim Powers, Paul Roman, the Young Stallion. God damn it, we won the Royal. Uh, excuse me, we won the Survivor Series, and we should have won it. We shouldn't have to share it with anybody. But when they do something like that, if if, if anyone knows anything about the psychology of wrestling, you know, they have a tendency to put over or give the win to the team or the individual that needs to get the push, that needs to be put over. And the Young Stallions and the Killer Bees were weak tag teams, in my opinion. We were not the British Bulldogs. We were not, I'm trying to think if there was, I think it was Tito Sintana Strike Force. Strike Force, yep. And I'm trying to think of who the other babyface team was. But we were not them. They were already over. So the Killer Bees and the Young Stallions needed to get over, probably equally. Yeah. You know, so let's give them the win. That gives them a shot in the arm. That gives them a little bit more of a push because they won. 
They shared the victory in the Survivor Series. And that's the way I looked at it. And again, I'm just one of those individuals that I'm not a bitter person. I, I could have been bitter. I could have been. There's a lot of, I'm sure you get a lot of people that you interview that are bitter and they get on here and they rant and they rave and they scream and they, what am, what am, what am I going to be bitter about? The WWF, WWE, WCW, well, the, 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 the professional wrestling in and of a whole has given me the experience to travel around the world, places I never would have gone to. And things that I probably never would have experienced were given to me by the world of professional wrestling. You know, and I say the world of professional wrestling, which encompasses the three companies. Yeah. Um, but I don't have any, um, maybe a younger, I may have had a little animosity, but I have no regrets. The only regrets I have are very, well, I shouldn't say they're little regrets because I don't want anybody to get pissed off at this, but... The regrets I have is that I was on the road so much that my daughter, who's now 18 years old, I didn't get to see her grow up on a daily basis, but I'm not alone in that boat. Uh -huh. There's a lot of other wrestlers out there. I mean, Kurt Henning had four boys or three boys. I'm not sure. But, you know, but the, the, the fact that we were able to be out there, do something that we enjoyed doing, have a passion for doing, and to be able to take care of our families. I mean, my, my ex-wife at the time, she didn't work. You know, she took care of my daughter. She did a tremendous job. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't have any, you know, the only minor regret is that I, on a day-to-day -day basis, I didn't get to see my daughter grow up. But would I trade it? Would I give it up? Would I? No. No, I would. And I know my daughter 18, at 18 years old, if she ever gets to hear this interview, she'll go, I can understand, because she wants to travel the world and she wants to do things on her own, too. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I, that, that, that would be the only regret, minor regret that I have. But I, would, I wouldn't have traded it for the world. I would not have traded it for the world. And because of that is because of me traveling and, and doing all I have and being all the places I've gone, all the major, city in, all the major cities in North America and every major city around the world, you know, I got to meet my wife now. She's a beautiful woman, and we, we get along tremendously. And so, I mean, it, 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 there's 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 an upside and there's a downside to it. But if I had to weigh the scales, I'd say the up is more so than the down. No, you know, I'm really actually glad to hear you say that, especially about the Survivor Series, because I was personally I was surprised, uh, you know, when Jim said that, because I, I kind of look at that. I mean, that's the first Survivor Series, and it's still going on today. So it means a lot to to be one of the survivors, whether you're doing it with somebody else or not. And I want to ask you, because I mentioned before the win over the Hart Foundation, the first Royal Rumble match, that you know you guys had a huge chunk of that very first show, and whether pay-per-view or not, it was the first one. What would you consider to be your highlight? Uh, you know, the, the moment that you know either you were, you were happiest at, at the time, or, or in hindsight, you know, your proudest moment from, from when you were with WWF. WWF. Wow. Um, WWF's a tough one. WWF. The company, it was a very, it's a, it's a, it was a, you always, it was a stress, it's a stressful environment. Um, what would be my highlight there? Um, you know, man, I just, um, just, it's something to do with, if, if you're looking for an answer as far as what I did in the ring, who I beat in the ring, or who I worked with in the ring, or any of that, I'm not going to, there's no answer to that, because that's all predetermined. You so know, was there ever a moment, though, that something happened where you, where you kind of looked at it, and you said, you know, I, I, I like, when, you, when you're out there, you're in the ring, and you look around, and you realize where you are, and you say, you know, I, I, I'll tell I'm you here. I, you, you, got, you, you got me there. Okay. Madison, no, not Madison, Madison Square Garden, I'm, I'm, I, here's one even better. Here's one even better. I had been wrestling for maybe a few months at best with WWF. And George Scott, who was a booker for w, uh, I'm sorry, WWF at the time before Pat Patterson and all that stuff, they called me last minute. And I live here in New Jersey, which is five minutes from the Meadowlands Arena, which is now the Eyes Up Center and all that stuff. And they called me to go there to wrestle a match against Kenny Patera. Now, Kenny Patera and I, and John, Kenny Patera and I had just had a match 
on TV, a TV tape match in Poughkeepsie, New York, where he tossed me around like a rag doll for about five minutes and then pinned me. You know, but that was my, that was my thing. That was my job and I understood it. And I had no, no ill will. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not, I didn't, I didn't get into this to be a superstar and look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm the intention getter. Anyway, so they called me and they said, listen, Jim, we, uh, we got a cancellation for, uh, the, uh, it was called the Metal Hands Arena at the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, I went down there, which is, like I said, I could, you know, from my house, I could spit and hit it. So I went down there, and, and I wrestled. I wrestled Kenny Patera, and instead of him tossing me around like a rag doll for five minutes, he tossed me around like a rag doll in front of 19,000 people for 11 minutes, and then beat me on the 12th minute. Something along those lines. I could be wrong as far as the minutes goes, but it seemed like an eternity, if you know what I mean. Uh -huh, I mean. But, so, I mean, and the following day, or two days later, in the newspaper was this little blurb from a guy named Bill Savage, who was my wrestling coach in high school. And it was like a, a nice little few sentences that said something about he's finally got his first professional athlete under his wing, ah, cool. which was Jim, you know, Jim Powers. He, he would happen to be watching the show on TV or on cable or wherever it was, and he realized that you know one of his wrestlers from high school had now made it to the to the big leagues. Even though I got my ass kicked for about 12 minutes and then got pinned by Ken Patera, who was an Olympic, champ, Olympic champion, you know, it was nice to see that in the paper that you know uh, my my old high school wrestling coach said, and now I've, I finally got my first professional wrestler, you know, under my really cool. That's really good. So that was, that was, that was, that was really nice. You know, and secondary was, you know, like, of course, you know, Madison Square Garden is like the mecca of, I don't know, you name the event, it's the mecca of it. Yeah. And to be there for the first time, um, and to look around at the people and go, well, wait a minute. I used to sit there because my aunt and uncle raised me. I used to sit. I used to sit in the audience with my uncle, who took me a few times and and watch Pedro Morales, Bruno San Martino, Ivan Koloff, and go, "Wow!" Only to be get chopped in the chest by by Mike Sharp about fifteen times <laughs> chest plate. But you know, it was all it was all worth it. It was all worth it. It really. It was just. You know, but the first thing being, like I said, the Meadowlands Arena where my high school wrestling coach um, acknowledged me as being one of, that he finally got himself a professional a professional athlete under his wing. Not realizing what he was saying as, as far as professional athlete, not knowing as much about the business, uh, the entertainment factor of the business as we do. But anyway, it was, it was, that was, that was really uh, genuine and sweet and it was really nice. Okay, yeah, that's a really cool one. Of the, and funny, too, because you, you talk about uh, he obviously knew you before the days that you were Jim Powers. And, you know, nowadays the Internet and everybody knows everything. You know, a lot of people, uh, you know, know your real name. And, and one of the things that I noticed was your, your real name could have actually been a wrestling name. So I was curious as to why, why you, you went with, with the name Jim Powers. Well, you know, people have told me that. They said, why did you go from the name Manly uh -huh. to Powers? And I said, well... I don't know, at the time when I got involved in wrestling, which is the early 80s, and I, was, I thought it was a cool thing to do, you know, I was I was doing it with somebody else, and he had changed his name, and actually, inevitably, he dropped out of it, but I mean, I said, well, okay, we got to come up with names, not even thinking that your own name may be kind of cool, Yeah. you know, so it was, uh, there was not much thought put into that, other than, well, we can't use our own names. You know, and, well, wait a minute, let me think about my own name. Maybe my own name is okay. And in hindsight, which is always twenty twenty, you know, I probably could have used that name and it wouldn't have mattered one way or the other. You know, it may have, it, 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 who, who knows, what's it, hey, what's in a name? Yeah, exactly, exactly. A rose man in a name. You take, you take Diesel and you take Razor Ramon, you shoot him, to, you shoot him at WCW, you make him Scott Hall. And Kevin Nash, and they're just as old, if not more. Exactly. exactly. It's all the same. It depends on who's playing, you know, the, the guy behind it. Absolutely. Well, you talk about WC, and, and you, you had a chance to, at least in the ring, 
uh, when you were with WCW. I think this is one of the things that uh, a lot of fans might even realize. I mean, you're one of the few guys who had a chance to, hey, wrestle the first Royal Rumble, but you also got spray painted by by the NWO when you're with you WCW. Know I see that on the t- I see that on YouTube and uh-huh. stuff. That's an inaccuracy. Oh, is it? To my, the best of my knowledge, okay. I have never. And I don't think there's any video. I have never gotten sprayed by the NWO. And I don't know exactly where I saw it. Was it's on your Wikipedia page, actually, which is... uh Wikipedia page, but it's inaccurate. Man. It's BS. It's not true. No one ever sprayed me with any kind of spray paint. I never had a snake lay on me. I never had... I'm trying to think of some of the other things that were out there that may have been put on me. Uh, but, no, I see that and I go... Where did someone come up with this? Because there was never, you know, I, I remember when the NWO, they, they when, when it first, it started in Daytona Beach when Hogan turned, and that was, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think, it was July 7th, 1996, as I met my wife now the next day. Uh, so I, I always remember that date, and no, I don't remember wow. ever, I mean, I, I wrestled the dark match with Hugh Morris, and there was never a time that I've got sprayed by the NWO or had that any kind of spray paint on my back or anything like that. And you know what I think? In all honesty, I think that the boys, Hogan, Randy, the higher up boys, they kind of respected me. I got along with all of them. I really got along with all of them. It's not that it's not that I wouldn't have done it for business. For business, I would have done it, especially WCW. WCW was the, 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 the best of my times, as crazy as that sounds. But in speaking to some of the individuals I spoke to last time I went to a WWF event or WWE event, mm-hmm. and I said, how's the atmosphere? Is it comparable to WCW? They said, not even close, Jim. WCW was a country club, and we all had fun. We made money, and it was just like a walk in the park. Yeah. You know, and I'm not going to name their names, but I mean, I and I could see, I could sense that. I really could. I could sense that. I went, I went down to the arena here, which is right next to my house, the Izod Arena, and I just could sense that tension in the air. That there's just something. I I just there's just something about that WWE that you're just you can cut it with a knife. You can cut that tension. That it's just that that that. I, I just, uh, I don't know. I just miss W. WCW was wonderful at the time. Kevin, when Kevin Sullivan was the booker, Kevin Sullivan treated me great. Kevin Sullivan, Kevin Sullivan treated me accordingly. I was happy with what he was doing with me. I was on a lot of nitros. I was on in the beginning. I was on almost every nitro. The first nitro, I think, I was on was with DDP, and that's because DDP requested to work for me. Oh, that's me. Cool. Cool. You know, so I'm very, uh, you know, as 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 you know, as much as I've traveled with WWF or WWE, uh, and, and been around the world and all the major cities in North, the cities in North America, I felt the most at home and felt the most treated the best at WCW. Now, whether that was Kevin Sullivan or whether that was, I don't know. It would have to be the Booker. It was Kevin Sullivan. Yeah. Kevin Sullivan treated me really good. The company treated me really good. They treated me accordingly. Uh, Teddy Long was good to me. Teddy Long helped me out a lot. Uh, what I was, wasn't was happy with was, you know, I wasn't happy with the fact that they wanted to make a tag team out of myself and Bobby Walker. But I'll let you answer a question because I feel myself going off on a rant here. No, I was going to say it. It's, uh, that's why I like doing these interviews because if you watch a lot of uh, you know, a lot of fans get their history from WWE documentaries. And, of course, you know, they conquer, they get to write history. And if you watch some of the documentaries with WCW, they'll bring in, you know, Chris Jericho, who obviously had issues with WCW. So, you know, he had this, some people have things to say. But a lot of these interviews that I do with people, Kevin Nash in particular, I mean, they, they say that WCW, I mean, Nash said specifically it was a party every Monday and he loved coming to work and the party continued after. It kind of seemed like... You know, nowadays there really isn't too many places to go. Once you leave WWE, you're kind of screwed. And, and back then, it kind of seemed like WCW was that place to go, and the guys that were there were, were just happy to be there. WCW, you'd go, you would want to go there and take a cut and pay. That's how nice it was. Yeah. I say that nice because you know, I mean, I don't mean that sound. I, 
like in a, in a pussy kind of a way, but WCW was just a nice place to be. You know, WWF, maybe you made more money, maybe you got more notoriety, maybe you, but you know what? You stressed out because of it. Uh -huh. It was just that kind of an atmosphere. You know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not pissing over the whole experience, but I just, you know, in the short time, the two and a half, or almost two and a half years that I was with WCW, it was like a walk in the park. It was a breath of fresh air. It was just wonderful. Because, I, I, you know, my wife and I at the time, my wife now, we lived in Orlando, and we would do our TV tapings at a Universal 10 days in a row, you know, so that was convenient for me. But, I mean, it was convenient for a lot of people because you were in one place for 10 days, and you got paid your per diem or whatever it was. Hello? Oh, yeah, there you are. <laughs> I was about to call you back and you said uh, you got your I per saw, diem for the 10 days that you were there. Yeah, I saw the phone crap out. I, I apologize for that. Uh -huh. But anyway, WCW was just a, a wonderful place. It was it was a wonderful place to be. It was a breath of fresh air. And uh, you know what? I hate to say it, and I said it earlier in this interview, that the boys always screw things up for the boys because... What I've seen happen over the years, and I don't care if I'm a preliminary enhancement job or whatever they want to call it, I've seen it happen. I'm not an idiot. You know, it's like, it's, 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 whenever, whenever we're put in a good situation, something that's sweet, something that's, not, that's nice, something that's going to pan out really well for us, we take advantage of it. And I'm not saying we, me, I mean, I recognize it now, but a lot of us, a lot of us that haven't grown up. You know, I mean, I, it's like I did this convention two and a half weeks ago or whatever it was. It was almost, yeah, it was almost close to two, two weeks ago. I mean, if I were that promoter who ran the convention, I don't know that I'd want to run another one. Yeah. Because he actually came to me and thanked me. You know, he was at that, that particular evening when I was trying to contain Scott and help Scott. The Scott I knew, not the Scott that was there, you know, he says to me, Jim, thank you, thank you. And he thanked me, kept thanking me. We're going to lose the building. We're going to lose the building. They're going to pull the plug on the show the next day, which was the convention where Flair was. and yeah. you know, Everything was going to take place. But this was the Friday before. you know. So what happens is the boys and, 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 and the wrestlers, the boys, they get put in a situation where it becomes you've been so... And I can relate to this. You've been so out of that party atmosphere for so long. Yeah. You've been sitting at home. You've been playing on your computer. You've been living vicariously through your computer about wrestling, whether it be MySpace, whether it be WWE.com, whether it be TNA, whatever it may be, uh -huh. that when you finally get into a situation where you're around all your peers from way back in the day, you just want to go ballistic. You want to go nuts. Yeah. So what you end up doing is you end up screwing, you end up screwing, the, 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 you end up screwing up what the promoter has laid out for you. Something nice that maybe can be done two, three, four, five times. Maybe it can be done every year. You know, so if, if the promoter gets a, a sour taste in his mouth because this one got arrested, this one broke up, uh, this one screwed up a, uh, uh, what, what was it? A, a roast? This one did this. This one did that. Did that? I'm not going to want to do it again. Me as an individual, not even a wrestler. I'm like, if I would have put my money into that, I wouldn't want to do it again. Yeah. These people are too difficult to control. It's like rock stars, like putting Molly Crew in a titty bar and tell them not to get a left dance. <laughs> exactly. The girls to put Molly Crew in a titty bar and tell them say, well, uh, no, you, you 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 leave the girls alone. Don't touch the girls. Yeah, exactly. It's stupid. Yep. You know, it's it's ludicrous. Don't don't so, kill anybody, OJ. What's that? I said don't kill anybody, OJ. Just don't. No, I. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you, you brought up TNA, and I wanted to ask you about it. Cause you mentioned WWF before, but is there any chance, uh, you know, TNA, or have you ever given any thought to doing something with them? I I um uh, I really haven't reached out to them. Um, uh, I don't know. I I only because. My, my realization of the business and knowing the business is, 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 as well as I as I know it uh, and it being political 
that Jeff Jarrett and I, we, we didn't, didn't quite see eye to eye. Okay. You know, and, and I feel bad, you know, because I never realized, you know, I know there's a karmic effect in life. And I didn't. I don't know exactly when it was. You know, I always thought Jeff Jarrett uh, was just a spoiled little brat. That Jerry Jarrett took care of him, and he was always going to be on top, and he was going to have a belt, and this and that and that and that and that. You know, and he was going to do his things his way, or he was going to run home to daddy, and daddy was going to take care of it, or whatever. So Jeff and I never really saw eye to eye. So when I knew Jeff was involved with it, I said, well. I'm kind of pissing up a rope here. Yeah. And then I saw Terry Taylor. You know, Terry Taylor was involved with the company. And I said, well, although I saved Terry Taylor on a few occasions um, where he's wanted me to babysit him because maybe he um, carried out a little bit too much the night before. Mm-hmm. So I babysitted him a couple of times. Even though I've done that, He's still business, and when he got to be the booker for a little bit in WCW, he showed me his, you know, there, there's ways of people, people showing you how they feel about you without really being direct, uh-huh. so you got to read between the lines. Yeah. So I didn't feel a good, I didn't, I didn't have a good feeling for Jeff Jarrett, nor did I have a good feeling for Terry Taylor. Um, but it was a shame, and I feel bad. When I saw on the internet, I think it was on the internet, or not, that that Jeff's wife, you know, had passed and all that stuff, and and I hated to think that, you know, I'm, I'm a very karmic person. I believe that what goes around comes around, and I would hate to think that karma was that strong and, and took that much of a took that much of a shot at Jeff Jarrett. You know, I don't think anyone deserves that. Mm. You know, yeah. but. Uh, so the TNA thing, I don't know. I mean, I've got Kevin Nash's number. I've got uh, I've got people's numbers that I can call that may be able to do something for me there. But when I watch the show, the few times I've seen the show, I go, I don't know if, if this. I know Scott Steiner's down there and Kevin's doing his thing, but Kevin's doing his thing. Kevin's doing his thing behind the scenes, and Kevin's more of a. Uh, not so much of working in the ring as opposed to um, he's great with the microphone. He's great. I'm trying to think of where I would fit in there. As far as the action part, that may and, and not. I hate to take away from myself or you know, but I got to be a realist here. You know, I've been around this business for a long time. Can I do the things these young kids are doing? And is that what the market is? But then again, I see Scotty Steiner who's got the great body, fantastic body, phenomenal body, and go, well, you know, is my body comparable or close enough to, or I can just get away with that? But no, I never really reached out to TNA or pursued it um, because of the political reasons, of the political, um, political, the political things that go on in this business. Absolutely. One of the last questions I want to ask you, Jim, thank you for everything. I want last question. We ask all of our guests the same question. Uh, if you could choose anyone, maybe somebody who's wrestling today that you haven't been in the ring with, maybe somebody that you grew up watching that you say, you know, I wish I could have the opportunity to work with this person. Or who would you pick? Oh, man. Everybody says that, yeah. Um, who would I pick? You know, well, now is it a baby face match or is it a heel match? Uh, it's up to you. It's a generic question. Uh, no, it's it's whatever role you'd like to play against whoever it'd like to be. Well, what if I wanted to have a baby face match with somebody? Okay. And then at the end we shook hands. Okay. Who would, who would you pick? Steamboat. Okay. If I wanted to have a heel match, although he's not working heel these days, Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake the Snake Roberts is the... Uh, epitome of a wrestling psychologist in this business. Ricky Steamboat is the epitome of class, um, ultimate baby face. I mean, there was an expression, there was something that was told to me, and it's hearsay, but I think, I think Rick, Ricky told me as well. 
he wanted to turn heel at one time. And he went to Pat Patterson and said, listen, I'd like to go out there and work heel and turn heel. And Pat Patterson said to Ricky Steamboat, now, again, this is hearsay, which a lot of wrestling is. And Pat Patterson said to Ricky Steamboat, Ricky, I can send you out there with a chainsaw. You can cut off Hogan's neck, arms, limbs, and the people would still love you. But, you know... Um, as far as if I wanted to work a babyface match and learn and learn and learn and learn, the epitome of a babyface is Ricky Steamboat. The epitome of a heel, even though he's not a heel when he works the independent circuit right now, is Jake the Snake Roberts. And Jake the Snake Roberts, in my opinion, is the best, the best mind, the best wrestling psychologist in this business, bar none. Absolutely. Oh, totally. I think um, to this day, I think the Tuesday in Texas, that whole Elizabeth angle and, and his, his, his promos surrounding all that, I thought it was, it's probably one of the most memorable things from any heel ever that I've ever seen. Well, you could get in the ring with Jake, and I have. You know, I mean, never we, ne we never, for, for whatever reason, I don't, I don't know why now, oh, wow. along, why they never dropped the snake on me or any of that, but maybe it was, you know, again, like I said, you know, I think a lot of the boys had respect for me, you know, and we got along and we clicked very well, that the things they would do to other people, they would say, well, we don't need to do that to Jim. Mm -hmm. We don't need to do that to Jim. I got along with, you know, I, I just happened to click with, I mean, Hogan, I mean, I, Hogan, Piper. I mean, I got along with the, I clicked, I, I mean, I got Piper's number in my speed dial. I mean, I, I click with so many guys that, you know, people go to me, well, wait a minute, you were just a job guy, you were just a preliminary, you were an enhancement guy, but, I mean, we clicked, it, it had nothing to do, I remember going to a restaurant, I remember going to the hotel in Boston at the airport, Boston Logan, we would catch a flight the next night, or the next day, and Hogan says, brother, you know, we go off to the room and order a shitload of Chinese food and I'll be up there, you know, uh -huh. You know, it was on his tab, you know, so I went up there, we ordered a shitload of Chinese food, and he came to my room. This is Hulk Hogan. Cool. This is a guy who was worth a couple hundred million dollars. Yeah. Come into my room to have Chinese food with me and Beefcake and a bunch of other people in the room. I mean, so I, you know, when people say to me, how do you know these people if you were on that level? I don't know. I mean, Kurt Henning, Kurt Henning and I, you know, we, you know, we, I, I don't want to say, we partied, we played, we did, we, we, we did stuff together. I mean, Rick Rude, I mean, even Kevin Nash and Scott Hall and all these guys. I mean, Scott, I mean, Marty Jannetty, Marty Jannetty I consider to be a, a tremendous friend, a tremendous friend. I may not speak to Marty for months on end, but when that phone rings and we speak, it's like I didn't miss a beat. We didn't miss a beat. You know, so it's, you know, I just, uh, it had nothing to do with it. I've, I've done this in interviews with, with people before. It, it, for whatever reason, and maybe that's something to do with me. I don't know. I'm not going to pat myself on the back right right now. But for whatever reason, I just happened to click. I mean, I mean, I remember with Hulk Hogan, we did it. We had to do a double shot. We were in Pontiac, Michigan. We did a re wrestling show in whatever arena that was up that way. And then we had a double shot in the afternoon. And Hogan called ahead and had this restaurant open up strictly for us. And there was about 20 of us at the table. Me, him, Piper, Kurt, Rick. I mean, I mean, it was just the who's who of wrestling at this table. And we were the only people in this restaurant. Crazy. And Hogan just pulled out his silver platinum mass, uh, silver platinum, whatever, I'm sorry, excuse me, platinum American Express and go, here. And he, you know, he made a comment to, to, to the, uh, the owner of the restaurant. He goes, I don't think you're going to have to do a, uh, uh, what the hell was the security check on this card or something like that, something along those lines, authorization check on this card. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I just, and I, I found myself, I'm going, I'm at this table, and these people are like super, super mega stars, you know. I mean, Piper and I, I mean, we, we, we tore up Halifax, Nova Scotia. I mean, to this day, I saw him. I saw Roddy a few months ago. He goes, remember that night we were in such and such a place and such a place? I said, Roddy, how do you remember that? He goes, God, Jim, I see it was great to be with you. And I'm going, wow. I says, you know, I'm just, you know, because it was, it was, it was, a, it was an individual clicking with an individual.
individual. Exactly. Well, I mean, it doesn't, yeah, it didn't matter. Like the whole, it, it, when, when you guys are like behind the scenes, it, it's all about you as a person and not about you as, you know, it, I think a lot of fans sometimes, they, they have a hard time distinguishing, you know, the, the people in the wrestling ring and then the real people behind the scenes. I mean, it's like if somebody saw me in a restaurant, I was an ultimate warrior, they go, oh, what's Jim Powers doing with ultimate warrior? Well, we're people. Yeah, exactly. And I just happened to click with these people. And I was like that with me when I was younger. And I was in high school or middle school, and I was mostly high school. You know, I got along with what people referred to as the jocks, mm-hmm. you know, which were the athletic blah, 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 blah. You know that. And I got along with what we refer, used to refer to as the heads, which were the stoners and this and that. I got along with both groups of individuals. And, and for whatever reason, again, I'm not patting myself on the back, but I just seem to click with these individuals. And I think they're tremendous. They're just people. Yeah. They're just wonderful, wonderful people. I mean, I mean, there's some of them that are assholes, but <laughs> yep. I mean, there are just wonderful people. I mean, Roddy Piper, you know, last time I saw him was nothing but more than gracious to try and help me out to get a job with WWE. Unfortunately, because for whatever reasons, it didn't pan out. But I mean, you know, here's my number, Jim. Here's your number. I remember this story. Remember that story. And even, you know, Undertaker. I mean, Mark. Mark is a tremendous individual. I mean, I got along with all these people. And when I tell, when, when, when sometimes when I, when I'm at the gym or people approach me and I said, well, this guy is my friend, or we did this or we did that, people look at me like a stunned dog. You know, they they twist their head and they go, well, is he out of his fucking mind? You know, he was a jobber. You know, he was a you know, he was an enhancement talent if you want to, if you want to buff up Jobber and make it sound nice. But I mean, I, I just, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, may, hey, may, maybe it's a shot in the arm to me. So. Oh yeah, I mean, well, it's, it's I think, I think a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of fans, especially nowadays, I think people are starting to, to see beyond, beyond that. I think a lot of the, you know, interviews like this has given people an idea of, of kind of, you know, it was more of a family environment. And for you, but, you know, when we close up here, we give everybody the same chance, so this would be your chance to, uh, to any fans out there who are listening and who are maybe for the first time getting an idea. I mean, what do you have to say to all your fans out there as we close up and to, to all the people who, you know, have watched you through the years and, like myself, have, have followed the Young Stallion, seen you, you live personally in WCW, WWE, followed your career. What do you have to say to the, uh, uh, the, the little uh, power maniacs out there? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being there. Thank you very much for appreciating what I've done. Thank you very much for coming out to the conventions. Thank you very much for coming out to an independent show, even though it's raining, snowing, whatever it may be, to come and see Jim Powers. Thank you for coming up to a table and asking for an 8x10 autograph picture of Jim Powers. Um, thank you for creating Jim Powers. Thank you for keeping Jim Powers going. Um, If it wasn't for you, there would be no me. And I think, I know that when I start, when I stop touching a young kid or an individual's heart, or when I stop seeing that glow in someone's eyes, then I know it's over. But I don't think that's going to come for a long time. So I thank you very much for creating and keeping Jim Powers alive. And I hope that you continue to keep Jim Powers alive because I want to keep going and I want to keep doing this thing, this thing called professional wrestling. And after this interview and maybe other interviews that you've heard, I hope you understand this thing called pro wrestling. You know, I love all the people out there that come out and I look in the kids' eyes and um, especially if it's a father or a mother, and they come up to me and they've got their little kid next to them, and they say, "Well, I used to watch this this man when before you were born, and he was my idol." And they have pictures from me from the '80s, and that keeps me going. And I just I just recently had a conversation with a friend of mine, Marty Janetti, and said, "You know what? I think I'm going to stop doing this." thing called professional wrestling, whether it be on an independent circuit or whether whatever minuscule way I can touch someone's life, whenever I can, whenever I feel I can no longer touch the 
kid's life or a person's life because of what I've done or what I may do. Who knows what I may do? I hope I do great things, you know. And maybe there's a lot of people out there that think I've already done great things. And thank you very much. When I think I'm done, then I'm done. Then I'll walk away from it. But I hope that you people out there keep me going. Keep throwing dry logs on the fire called Jim Powers. Awesome. Jim Powers, from all of us, man, thank you uh, for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you very much, James.